Mr. Potter, our new celebrity. <sighs> There's so many great actors in this movie who aren't with us anymore. So yeah, I am revisiting the Harry Potter films every single one of them, which to date is ten. Eight in the main series and two Fantastic Beast films. Um, I'm not revisiting the books. I don't have the time to reread the books, but I do have the time to rewatch the movies. We're gonna go through. I'm gonna be releasing one of these every two weeks. And of course, we must start with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone if you live in a country where publishers think you're dumb and the Philosopher's Stone everywhere else. The very first Harry Potter film, and this is an interesting thing to go back to. I have to wonder how many people, unless they are, you know, my age and trying to introduce their own kids into the thing, how many people actually go back and watch the very first one? It's a bit of an odd beast, um, especially in the wake of the whole thing now being a finished product. It is a little bit clunky. The thing is, I'm not sure there was a lot of ways around that because this has a lot to do, like, for, there is a reason that virtually no other, you know, based off a, a you know, teenage, young teens aimed fantasy book series trying to adapt into a movie, almost none of them got past a first film. You know, we had so many false starts. You know, there was... Spiderwick Chronicles, and there was, what was it, City of Bones, and, like, there were, a, there were so many of these things. Like, the only one that got to sequels, you know, before dystopian fiction took over was, uh, was Chronicles of Narnia, but that was, like, that had name recognition. But my point is, these openings are hard, because not only do you have to introduce us to all these characters, and set up everything that we need to know about this world in order to understand anything that's going on, you also have to find a way to tell a story that's actually interesting and worth telling as you do all this stuff. It's really hard. And it's actually especially hard in film as opposed to the book. Because while I haven't reread the book in a while, the book it gets to take its time. It gets to be more leisurely paced. It gets to introduce a lot more stuff just through classroom scenes, just through very natural interactions between characters. Whereas the film is stuck dumping a lot of exposition into fewer scenes because by its nature, even over two hours, not everything, not every scene that was in the book can make the movie. So when you cut some, you have to figure out, crap, well, there was this information that was in that scene. We now got to put it here. There's a lot of expo exposition dumps. There's a fair number of exposition dumps in the book as well. But honestly, exposition dumps tend to read better on text than they do in film. Because when, a ca when an actor has to say these things and try and make it sound like natural dialogue, it kind of highlights that you're just getting exposition dumped on you. Getting to read it, it flows a little more naturally. And in many ways, this film was approached very safely. I mean, just look at the director. I mean, they got, they got Chris Columbus. You don't hire Chris Columbus because he has a unique singular vision. You hire Chris Columbus because he's going to shoot the script that you give him. And that's exactly what he did. He also has a decent amount of experience uh, working with kids, so that was, that was probably part of the reason as well. But in a lot of ways, this film, to look at it, feels like a, it's working off a checklist. Like, what's the stuff that is most iconic in the book that people are going to expect to see and is required for the plot to work? And then it just kind of goes down a list. And there are a lot of jumps in time as a result of that that feel like much bigger jumps on film than they do in the book. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm nailing down like some of the hurdles and some of the stumbling blocks. And like, like I said, I'm not sure there was really much of a way around a lot of this stuff. But there are uh, a couple of things that right off the bat, this thing nailed. If there's a superpower to this franchise as a whole, it's casting. The casting is flawless. 
not every performance is flawless, but I think part of that has to do with the fact that this is the first time these actors are playing these roles, having to say these words and understand this world. You can hear even some of the very good actors stumble over some of the, what are to them, nonsense words. And so, like, the first time Maggie Smith says the word muggles, she, like, she pauses right before saying the word, whereas in the natural flow of the sentence, you just barrel through that, that word. And, and I don't mean to single her out. There's plenty of that from plenty of actors. And so you do have a little bit of that going on, but everyone is still cast very, very well. And I do include the kids in that. At this point in time... Rupert Grint as Ron probably gives the most fun and natural feeling performance. I'm not sure that's necessarily because he was a more natural actor at the time. I think it probably has to do with the fact that Ron gets the least amount of exposition. Uh, you know, Hermione delivers a lot of exposition. And Harry, not necessarily spouting a lot of exposition, but he has to set up a lot of exposition because he's the one getting it spouted at him. So he has a lot of wooden setup lines so that other people can then spout exposition at him. You know, you can see how both Harry and Hermione, uh, Emily Watson and Daniel Radcliffe, are sort of... You can tell when they go from a scene where they are feeling the interaction and a scene where they are just reading the line. And again, I don't mean to make that as a criticism because, again, when you get actors that young, that's kind of going to be what ends up being the case. And it comes down to how much of the script are they stuck with lines that, like, there's no way to make this sound natural. There are some actors who actually can, even with the clunky exposition, are able to smooth it out. I think the big one just being Hagrid. Like, Hagrid is the VIP of this first film because everything he says, and he says a lot of nonsense and a lot of exposition, he makes it sound casual, he makes it sound conversational, in a way that most of the other actors can't do consistently yet. But again, I'm prepared to forgive that for the most part, especially keeping in mind that this, this is first go for pretty much everybody involved. One thing that I, and I debated whether or not I was going to bring this up, but I thought about it, and yeah, yeah I am. Some of the effects really suck. And here's the thing. I was reluctant to bring that up because I knew people were going to go, dude, the effects are, they're almost 20 years old at this point. You know, why are you knocking them? They were fine for the time. The thing is, they weren't fine for the time. You know how I know they weren't fine for the time? This movie came out in 2001. You know what else came out in 2001? Fellowship of the Ring, the first Lord of the Rings movie. And do you know which of those two had a higher budget? Harry Potter. By 30 million. It had a 30% higher budget than the first Lord of the Rings movie. It doesn't look nearly as good. Whenever it comes to green screen, CGI effects, and the compositing of CGI components. It just looks clunky. And it's not because they didn't have the money to throw at it. And they uh, and they obviously aren't skimping. There's a lot of very good-looking stuff here. The practical effects, when they go practical, are terrific. And the sets are great. Costumes are wonderful. And, and like I said, I know the technology was better than this. Because you look at things like the Troll and the Centaur or the green screen on the Quidditch matches. And it's... It's not good. Even for the time, it was not good. And I have the distinct feeling that what it was is they shrugged their shoulders and went, the movie's for kids, that it won't bother them. We don't need to do better than this. Whereas Lord of the Rings, they knew they were going to be dealing not only with young people wanting a fantasy adventure, but with like long-time D&D nerds and literary academics and, like, people who were really going to put them through the ringer, scrutiny-wise. I think Warner Brothers and the Harry Potter folks, they figured, this is good enough for kids. Now, things get better on the special effects front. Actually, I would say almost immediately, to my memory. We'll see when I revisit the next one. But, like, to my memory, effects work got better pretty much right off the bat with the very next sequel and then kept getting better after that. But this first one, it's, it's not up to snuff. But let's come back to some of the casting. 
some of these actors. I mentioned the kids, and all the kids are good, and they're all solid, especially for their first go with some very clunky lines. They get the job done, although, like, I feel bad, yeah, I feel really bad for any line Daniel Radcliffe had to loop, and they had to do as a dub over later, because you can always pick those lines out. They are so wooden. The worst is when he's confronting Voldemort at the very end, and, like, Voldemort's ghost or whatever like rises up and like passes through him and Harry gets knocked back and you hear ah it's really bad and I don't want to be like he, he was 11 at the time and I don't want to pick on him and I actually think he's a he's a pretty dang good actor now but boy <laughs> man that that jumped out at me really badly but uh, with the adults, and let's get back to some of that amazing casting, because we have uh, Maggie Smith, who I mentioned, and she has a, a wonderful ease to the way that she plays McGonagall. Uh, you have <sighs> Alan Rickman in that voice as Snape. He was perfect casting. So, so very good. Then there's Richard Harris as Dumbledore. And, you know, I think, I, obviously we get to spend more time ultimately with Michael Gambon as, as uh, Dumbledore, but Richard Curtis brought a real, he had a real twinkle in his eye, which I think was just a quality he had as a human being. Um, but you can, you can hear, like, at this point in his life, his health wasn't great, and he knew that even when he took the role. Um, and you can hear, you know, kind of a strain sometimes, but he's still, he's still got that little bit of mischievousness behind that. And despite the fact that, like, it, and this isn't supposition, this is known that he was basically blackmailed by his grandkids to take this part. <laughs> they basically said they wouldn't talk to him again if he turned it down. Um, he does seem to be enjoying it. And I think maybe it's because he knows that it's going to make you know, his own grandkids happy. Maybe that was what was fueling him, but he does seem to be happy to be there. And there's something just nice about that. Um, even though there isn't honestly a, all that much to his performance, but there's just a sweetness, which is really what Dumbledore needs to have, especially in these early stories, because we need to get why Harry idolizes him. We need to idolize him uh, the way that Harry does, you know, so that that can all get smashed apart at later dates, but let's not, uh, let's not get ahead of ourselves. But like I said, the casting is, is the secret, um, what not, not so secret weapon of this franchise as a whole. And from right out of the gate, all the Weasleys are wonderful. Draco Malfoy. Oh God, he's so slimy, slimy little twerp. He's really, really, really good for that. Uh, Tom Felton and uh, the Dursleys. Oh God, Richard Griffiths and so hateable. Another one we've lost. Oh, I got to see him on stage in Equus with Daniel Radcliffe in London. Oh, that was a good show. But the original Harry Potter in a vacuum, looking at it completely on its own as if it isn't kicking off a franchise would just register as okay. But as a first step, as a building block, as a foundational piece on which to build later work, it's actually really good for that. It is better as a piece of foundation than it actually is as a film unto itself, if you're able to sort of, you know, take the nostalgia goggles off and look at it without having the rose-tinted glasses on. If you can do that, it's, it's just, it's fine. It gets the job done. But the job that is getting done needed to be done if anything better was ever going to come out of it later. But I think, you know, there's a reason when I'm like, I want to, I feel like a little bit of a Harry Potter movie. I never pop this one in. But uh, that'll wrap up this one, folks. So, if you want to support me, there are uh, links to my Patreon down below. Uh, it is much appreciated. It helps uh, support the show and helps me cover my bills. Uh, there's the like button. That's a huge help. Uh, folks have been hitting that lately, and I appreciate it. You can subscribe. There's uh, links below that for my book and for merch. Whatever you want to do, there's stuff down there to, to do and explore and click, or you also don't have to. I mean, at the end of the day, folks, you're the council. I'm just running the meetings, and until next time, 
This council is adjourned. Swish and flick. Thank you.